Hello, I'm Rajiv Gulati from the Division of Cardiovascular Diseases, Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. Joined today by my colleague, uh, Dr. Suraj Kappa, who is also a cardiologist, but who specializes in electrophysiology. And we're gonna to talk today about Brugada syndrome. Suraj, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Gulati. Perhaps you can start by telling us, what is Brugada syndrome? So that's a great question. And one I think that is fairly commonly misunderstood it's important for people to understand that Brugada has been recognized for decades now as a syndrome. And what it is is an abnormality in the ion channels of the heart, which result in abnormalities in how the normal heart cells activate, which in turn can result in patients suddenly dying, such that they can just be walking down the street and experience either sudden syncope or experience actual sudden death, which they don't work at wake up from unless there is somebody around to resuscitate them. It's estimated that about 0.1 to 0.6% of the population carry the genetic characteristics that may put them at risk for having Brugada. But it's important to discern between a Brugada pattern and the Brugada syndrome. Because many patients might have an electrocardiogram that shows Brugada but does not necessarily mean they have the syndrome or at risk of sudden death, though all of them may have these genetic abnormalities that cause the problems in the ion channels. And when we look at Brugada syndrome, we come to understand that it's a much more multifaceted disease than just saying it's a genetic mutation or it's an abnormal electrocardiogram, but really putting all of those factors together into the diagnosis. Very interesting, thank you. So, so me as a non-EP guy, you know, we worry about missing the Brugada pattern on the ECG, but also worry about overcalling it sometimes. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can elaborate on, on some of the challenges in making the diagnosis. So that's a wonderful question as well. The truth is that Brugada can be extraordinarily challenging from both estimations. There are other syndromes and other diseases that can look like a Brugada pattern on an electrocardiogram. When we talk about the Brugada pattern, we talk about abnormalities in V1 and V2 on the electrocardiogram in the two precordial leads. The reason for that is when we look at the heart and where Brugada affects the heart, it's principally around the right ventricle mm -hmm. along the right ventricular outflow tract where we see the abnormality in terms of the substrate of the heart. And that in turn creates abnormalities in those two precordial leads that are looking at that anterior surface of the heart. Once we look at that, we realize that there are other types of diseases that can show similar abnormalities. Arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia can look very similar, and even a typical right bundle branch block can be mistaken for that. So you can see a baseline electrocardiogram, which is suggestive of the abnormality, but actually isn't Brugada. The flip side, though, as you were alluding to, is also underdiagnosis. And the problem there is, not every single electrocardiogram from the same person will necessarily reveal the Brugada pattern. And thus, you need to be cautious to review all electrocardiograms, especially under conditions of stress, because sometimes specific stressors, fevers, use of tricyclic antidepressants, anesthesia exposure, surgery, can result in revealing the Brugada pattern on an electrocardiogram where it would not otherwise be present at baseline. And thus, it's important to consider patients who may come in with nondescript symptoms, syncope, otherwise normal electrocardiogram, or seizures even, because that can also be secondary to ventricular arrhythmias, where you lack appropriate blood flow to the brain. And then, even though they have a normal electrocardiogram, maybe do provocative maneuvers in order to bring it out. That's really informative, thank you. So, so just let's work through this and so say I see an ECG in a convincing story from a patient and there is a concern for the Brugada pattern. Mm -hmm. Walk us through what you do next. How do we uh, provoke, uh, risk stratify, who mm -hmm. needs uh, uh, invasive treatment? Perhaps you can help us with that. Okay, so there's a couple of things we need to think about. Say I get a patient in clinic walking in their physician was concerned. They saw the Brugada pattern on the electrocardiogram. I talked to them. The first key point in my mind is to say, okay, does this person have symptoms or not? 
by symptoms, I mean, have they had episodes where they've suddenly passed out just walking down the street or doing something that would not otherwise be associated with them having any issues with feeling faint? Are they having seizures or other nondescript symptoms that might be suggestive of an abnormal ventricular rhythm? Once I establish that they have symptoms, and I look at that electrocardiogram and it is very suggestive of a Brugada pattern, a lot of my trip is done at that point. Because what we found is those patients who have symptoms and the Brugada pattern are quite high risk for further arrhythmic events. And you can put one and one together to make two, which would be the ICD. Without doing further strategies such as EP studies or echocardiograms. The difficulty becomes in those patients who have maybe a suggestive pattern on the electrocardiogram of Brugada, but it's not classically that, or the patients who have the classic pattern but don't have the symptoms. Mm. And that's where really the problem ri arises. In the patients who have symptoms, but the Brugada pattern is suggestive but not quite there, we can take them to the electrophysiology laboratory and provide them sodium channel blockers such as flecainide or procainamide challenge in order to try and elicit the Brugada pattern. But even before that, one thing that physicians commonly forget is if you just move V1 and V2 one interspace higher, you can actually elicit a classic Brugada pattern that is, goes along with actually having the syndrome at that point. The other side of it is you can actually turn around and say, well, this patient's asymptomatic. I can't elicit a clear history of anything that would suggest them ever having had a ventricular arrhythmia. And then we're in a little bit of a pickle because what do we do with them? Because frankly, we don't want them to have their first incident being walking down the street and suddenly dying and not having anybody around to resuscitate them. So a lot of people over the last 20 years have looked into the role of electrophysiology studies where we try to provoke the ventricular arrhythmias in the EP lab. And while one large group has suggested that yes, if you can provoke the arrhythmia during an EP study, then this is Brugada syndrome, you put in an ICD. Unfortunately, we've seen exactly the opposite in other large scale studies, where from other large groups they've said, it doesn't matter. And we're talking asymptomatic patients here. Exactly. Never had any symptoms, never had anything suggestive of, of a ventricular arrhythmia in the past. So it's an area that is not resolved yet. Do, do we here at Mayo have a particular um, um, belief in one version, which will be EP testing plus or minus ICD versus a conservative watchful waiting strategy? Do you have any personal mm -hmm. thoughts in that matter? So there's, there's several factors that go into it. One of the things is genetic analysis. We do recognize that there are certain genetic mutations. Um, the most common genetic mutation is in the SCN5A sodium channel that might be associated with higher risk of an arrhythmic event in population studies. And maybe that could help. Unfortunately, the lack of a positive genetic test does not necessarily mean that they don't have a genetic mutation. Right. And that's the difficulty. And also, a genetic mutation, and this is research we've published out of here on multiple different subjects, does not mean that that is a pathogenic mutation or the mutation causing the problem. There's such thing called background noise. Got it. So the problem becomes, it can help, but it's not perfect. The next step is, and this gets back to everything in medicine, talk to the patients. Talk to them about what the potential risks are. Some might say, look doc, this is the biggest fear in my life. I want everything done to reassure me as much as possible. And you might say, okay, let's do an electrophysiology study. If we don't provoke anything, all the data is suggestive that that is a very good, suggestive, negative prediction of you having an arrhythmic event in the future. But the problem is what to do with the positive electrophysiology study at that point. The other thing we always talk about is talking to the patient about how can we monitor you. Maybe that weird symptom you had, that feeling of lightheadedness or palpitations that you otherwise can't describe might have been suggestive of a ventricular arrhythmia. And one option that's available to us today is implantable loop recorders, where we can actually place a very tiny device 
in right underneath the skin. They can record for up to three years. And not only for symptoms, but we'll have preset criteria to identify ventricular arrhythmias. Fascinating, thank you. So identifying the, those at low risk seems like a nice option and can mm -hmm. be reassuring, but trying to figure out those who are high risk remains a challenge. Fascinating. True, exactly. So again, as a non-EP guy here, you mentioned that the problem is local, it's confined to a region in, in, in the right side of the heart. Why not just ablate that area? <laughs> so that's a wonderful question as well. So this is only something that's recently been come to be understood. When we look at the Brugada syndrome, people have looked at what the pathology is of the heart in these patients. Why is the electrocardiogram so localized in that area? Those original pathology studies demonstrated that there is some fatty changes within the epicardial surface of the anterior aspect of the right ventricular outflow tract. Mm. And this led to many people saying, hey, exactly, if this is so localized, why can't we take care of it by just addressing the substrate? Say somebody is having recurrent ICD shocks for ventricular arrhythmias, or say somebody's having um, recurrent symptomatic VT, though not necessarily ultimately resulting in shock, can we do something about this? And the truth is, at least a couple of investigators have demonstrated that by going in and performing what we call an ablation, where we burn throughout the area of abnormal substrate, particularly focused on the epicardial surface, that they can not only prevent future ICD shocks, but in fact, the Brigada pattern disappears on the electrocardiogram and is no longer provocable. However, of course, these are in small numbers of patients and larger scale studies are necessary in order to understand what we're actually seeing. That's, so it's fascinating. So, so ablation hasn't yet replaced. We're not confident enough to say, well, we can maybe replace the ICD. Mm -hmm. It would be as an adjunctive thing for certain subsets. Exactly, and I think that's okay. an important point because the fact is, for these patients, the ablation might work, but say the ablation doesn't. They may still have a ventricular arrhythmia that may lead to their sudden death. Okay. And thus, in those high-risk patients, those patients who are judged to have sufficient risk to merit being concerned about the ventricular arrhythmia burden and the risk of sudden death, you still need to put in the ICD. Fascinating. So, so what else is on the horizon for Brugada? So one of the things that's on the horizon is how do we treat these patients with a defibrillator? Nowadays, we have sub-Q ICDs. One of the reasons that we're having all of this rigmarole about what do we do, do we put the ICD in or not, is because putting in a transvenous ICD is not a simple thing that is now without deal. any sort of right. risk. Right. These are young patients. When we look at that epidemiology we were talking about earlier, if you go to South Asia, for instance, it's estimated that 50% of all unexplained sudden deaths in structurally normal hearts in patients less than 50 are due to Brugada syndrome. And similarly, in European populations, it may be as high as anywhere from 10 to 30 percent. Mm. So if you think about that, you don't want to miss those. The problem, though, is these are young people. If you put a transvenous ICD where you have an ICD lead going through the venous system and into the heart itself, these leads scar in place over time. If they ever have an infection 20 years down the road, it's not a trivial process of taking this wire out. And there's risks of inappropriate shocks in patients who can get their heart rate well above 200 because they're otherwise healthy. So you want to recognize the, po the problem of putting an ICD willy-nilly in patients who don't need it necessarily and will never use it. The subcutaneous ICD may change that to some extent because the truth is that it's not endovascular. So that risk of scarring in place isn't there inside the heart and thus removing it can be much more simple. The negative being that you're still at risk potentially of inappropriate shocks, and not everybody might be a candidate for the subcutaneous ICD. Thus, you still need to think about that risk stratification, and we need to start thinking about better ways of understanding how to risk stratify. Some of the things we're looking at include, can we understand the substrate better in advance of putting an ICD? Say the electrophysiology study is negative. Say they have clear MRI abnormality in that right ventricular outflow tract. Is the substrate enough to push us one way or the other? Are there other provocative maneuvers that might help us? Should all of these patients be getting a loop recorder? These are things we need to understand better, and this is really what's on the horizon, to follow these patients 
Well, that's fascinating. Well, I've learned an awful lot, as always, from you, Siraj. I appreciate uh, you sharing your knowledge. Um, thanks uh, to everyone for joining us. Uh, it's been a real pleasure for me, and I hope uh, it's helped uh, some of you uh, understand this fascinating condition.